Hello there. Being a journalist in India comes with many adventures and also many hardships. And few have had as many as the investigative journalist Anirudh Behel. He's the founder and editor in chief of CobraPost.com, also a co-founder of Tehelkar.com. Back in the day, he's worked for India Today, Outlook magazine during its heyday, and Down to Earth as well. And more to the point, Anirudh was instrumental in breaking two of the biggest stories in the last 25 years: the match-fixing scandal in cricket and a corruption scandal in politics which brought down a defense minister and a then bjp national president that's on the plus side but on the minus side he has also been dragged to court innumerable number of times and has had police protection for up, up to 8 years now anirudh behel has a new book out and uh, it's called a taste for trouble uh, and it's truly an entertaining read uh, so we thought this is a good point at which to talk about what it is like to be a journalist in india how do you be a successful journalist how do you make impact is it more difficult these days is it easier we're going to talk about all of these things anirudh thanks so much for speaking with us on media buddhi thank you thank you thank you for having me okay my first question is and and the thing hit me when i was reading the book was that your career started in what 1991 so that's right. really my question is journalistic career maybe in in the last 30 years uh, is it more difficult to be a journalist today and is it also less fun to be a journalist today well the answer is both yes and no if you say is it uh, easier to be a journalist of course it is easier to be a journalist we never had social media when we were when in the in our formative years here you have a audience that you can talk to who 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 uh, possibly give you a whole pipeline of ideas a whole pipeline of uh, stories sometimes a feedback which is uh, which is immediate and uh, which is quite uh, you know you, you can measure you know in numbers the impact uh, of your work so to speak but if you look at the and then it is easier also for uh, people to disseminate uh, or and have their own blogs have their own youtube channels which was something which we could never have i mean people who have been sacked or who have been laid off mainstream media a lot of them you have examples of starting their own blogs on youtube and making quite a success of it actually so these kind of avenues weren't open then they're open now so that's the plus side but if you look at the sort of um, the not so good side as i would say it would be the fact that when we started off i, I mean i would judge a reporter does he have a hunger for a story i mean that does a story really tick him the hunt for a story is one of the big pleasures of journalism i mean does it really tickle you to be you know going for a story and then getting it and then um, the fact that you do it whether it is for print or television or digital etc and is there a premium on it in the office in the media platform that you work for unfortunately there is no premium in the media office or platform for stories so to speak for journalists who get you stories and that is the sad part okay we will we'll come to the question of how uh, you know how many challenges there are in front of journalists today or journalism today a little later but i i want to to take us to the match fixing investigation uh, in my memory at least i think of it as one story but i realized when i was reading your book that the first story was maybe 1997 the last was in the early 2000s and maybe probably the most important uh, story that really blew open everything landed uh, or was published on the same day uh, uh, in 2001 when vvs lakshman was making that 281 uh, score right. in eden gardens so really my question is which was more important for cricket in india was it the story was it 281 that's part of the question but really uh, the match fixing investigation took so many years i mean yeah it was a series of stories it was not just one story and and actually i remember when we first did it in 97 uh, there was this whole sense in the fraternity that we were running a mouse by everyone that we had just made it up so to speak and uh, we got sued by the bcci for 5 crores at that time it was a humongous sum of money and uh, then eventually other stories started happening and the shane warne mark wog betting controversy that they had taken money from a bookie the pakistani match fixing report rashid latif uh, then of course hansi kronia the big one then of course manoj prabhakar and then um, uh, for good or bad um, I, i kept doing those stories and taking the story forward and eventually even the bcci withdrew their case and then 
there were a lot of other things the chandrachur investigative in a committee etc etc but as i said it was a series of stories and there was incredulity and cynicism when we first broke it but gradually people came to see that yes it is true and then the story so it 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 it, it took 3 4 years for the whole blown for the for everything to sink in and then of course much later in 2007 you remember the ipl investigation that happened on betting yes. etc you know so those were later things and i wasn't involved then but uh, i'm saying that the very fact that there was betting in cricket and that there was match fix i mean there was betting everybody knew there was betting in cricket illegal betting but the fact that there was match fixing also oh, was, was the first time that blew the lid uh, in the whole uh, sports and as for yes, your question about was 281 i mean if you're a sports lover obviously i mean i i remember you, you know missing out on that uh, on that historic win for india in calcutta but uh, it it was a marvelous innings yes uh, you know one of the things that that struck me while while reading the whole thing was this is a story that ended the career of obviously many many cricketers including mohammad azuruddin hansi kronya and ajay jadeja uh, and in terms of impact it was huge but i'm i'm coming to my next question really which is the impact of your next investigation which i want to sp- speak about which is operation west end which ended the career of a sitting bjp president and forced resignations at the highest levels of government but really the question i want to focus on here is you know the the, the idea that investigative journalism of this kind takes a lot of money uh, if if i'm not right it cost if i'm not wrong rather it cost at least 10 lakh rupees uh, you, you no, say no, in a book a small part of, part of the investigation compute the salaries of the journalists the time the talent yes. the, the people transcribing it so it it is not an easy figure perhaps uh, you, you end up with much more than that and at yes, that time we, we had a, a lot of venture funding and we could afford to do it so but now people spending just stating stories for 6 months 1 year is a very unusual phenomena you won't have media houses doing that because there is a culture of uh, instant coffee culture and you want instant results you you that bite culture has so permeated the newsrooms that if they see a reporter sitting idle for two days three days they think that it's a money not worth spending and they put him on the regular beat cycle and that's what destroys all your special investigative teams because once you start using the journalists for normal stories then the whole thirst drive and the patience goes away and then you don't really get investigative stuff because for investigative stuff you need time talent money and then of course you need you need a whole bunch of ideas and you need an editor curating and managing the whole team yes so today i would estimate that it would take lakhs and lakhs of rupees to do one particular story uh, and and we we saw a kind of parallel uh, the 2018 me too investigations in the united states against harvey weinstein by the new york times and the new yorker uh, one estimate is it cost more than a million dollars to do that that just that one story so uh, it's interesting that you say it's not possible at all in today's climate uh, to to do these really single stories but huge impact uh, but the other aspect of it is also the cost of doing such stories now you say in your book and i quote we were the pilot project of the right wing vendetta machine that's the entire quote uh, and this is in reference to the official secrets act case that was against you and how many years you took just dealing with it tell us a little about what it was like to be uh, having to go to the courts every other day for so long yeah it was quite a, it was a battle of attrition because it was the first time we were doing it and no matter what anybody says it does take a toll on you it takes a toll in terms of time i am a novelist i write novels also it's i love literature and it took me away from my books my night time reading became affidavits and um, you know it 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 creates a whole paranoid aspect in your personality it creates a whole uh, uh, you know um, the resources of it uh, you know managing lawyers lawyers managing you uh, you know It, it, it is a totally different uh, ball game, and and many media houses who can't afford those lawyers uh, turn out on the back. We were lucky that there were a lot of public spirited lawyers who helped us along the way, uh, mostly due to personal connections, but also due uh, also because of a sense of public service. And um, there are many such lawyers still around. And uh, 
I think if you do work, you attract a lot of these lawyers who are willing to help you. And a lot of these lawyers are still around. And um, I think uh, for significant work, they do pitch in and help you. Right. Uh, question that uh, again comes to mind is, uh, you did mention, of course, this is a pilot project of the right-wing vendetta machine, as I said. So is this because this case was, uh, was against you and your team during the time of the first NDA government, uh, uh, which lasted a full term? You see, it, it, it is more, uh, I mean, they were perhaps not as ruthless and as venomous then as they are now. In fact, but it wasn't due to lack of effort. I mean, which, which story in India has had a judicial commission on it? None. Which story in India has had an official secret act case? Uh, you know, all manner of cases on it, ED, income tax, etc. I remember um, uh, uh, income tax officer asking us whether we had uh, um, done a tedious deduction on the monies that various politicians took in our story. So there, were, there was a Kafkaesque absurd atmosphere to all that as well. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, it is a whole battle that you have to fight within your resource, limited resources. You're not a mainstream, you don't have unlimited resources. You have to depend on friend and family and lawyers. And uh, it just, it takes a toll on you. And, and, and uh, in the end, uh, you sometimes start questioning whether you should have got into it. But then in my case, it was, I had a very supportive family. And uh, now that I look back at it, perhaps that was the only way. I mean, somebody just had to sort of go ahead. And we are happy that we created a lot of case law, which a lot of media platforms and journalists are utilizing now. Especially in oh, that the official secret act case, in, in, in our undercover investigations and so on. So in, in that sense, uh, we created a lot of case law for others to come behind us. <laughs> yeah, I just realized that's a fringe benefit of all the trouble that you went through. Uh, and Anir, Anir, you also answered another question partly, which I was going to ask, which I asked several people. How do you cope with the fear element or the stress element of investigative journalism or any journalism? Because, uh, you know, you mentioned the support of your family and the support of uh, the legal fraternity. How else does one today deal with the fear and insecurity and the stress that comes with this kind of reporting? I think uh, loving family is number one. Your, uh, uh, your friend circle, which supports you. So it's very, very important to have a support structure. Whether it is just to kind of sometimes crib and talk and, and uh, you know, maybe something as basic as that. But I think it is valuable to uh, involve a lot of uh, senior journalists as advisory roles, not publicly, but privately. Uh, and also ex-bureaucrats, publicly spirited ex-bureaucrats who may advise you off and on. Uh, so it is very, very, um, there should be these uh, 300 numbers on your phone that, that you can call up at any time and, and, and explain the crisis you are in and take advice. That is very, very essential. Uh, it also helps sometimes uh, if uh, there are people who can help you with limited resources for lawyers and travel and so on and so forth. And a lot of media organizations are now cracking that. I mean, people forget that Tehelka was the first media website that came in, the news website, and it was way back in 2000. At that time, the internet connectivity wasn't great. And, and, and now people are building, starting to build communities. At that time, it was too early to build communities around your platform. So the wire, news laundry are building communities around them, which is so healthy. I mean, uh, news laundry just the other day, I think, pulled in just on subscriptions, maybe in a month, uh, 15, 20 lakhs, which is, which is a humongous figure for us. And so in that sense, these growing communities are very, very important. The, uh, the, the um, example of that is News Tapa in South Korea. I mean, uh, they have managed to create a community of nearly 1 million subscribers. And they are like vocal News Tapa um, community. They have community events. They have new Tapa t-shirts and, and they love the work of the media platform they're supporting. So it's a sense of empowerment that you're giving to a lot of people. So um, my advice would be to build communities, net personal networks you can depend upon. So going forward, building communities is the way. That's great. That's an, that's an entire playbook that you've given us, Anirudh, starting from family and ending with community. Uh, my last question, perhaps, unless, you know, whatever you say provokes another one is, how, I mean, looking at your career and looking at some of the big stories, a lot of it have, they've been broken because of the use of sting operations and hidden cameras and, 
you know, other means of hiding the process of reporting. Now, when we read uh, case studies at Columbia Journalism School or whatever, there is this, people say, you know, there is this ethics of media reporting and you can't do certain, 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 you can't, you can't report in a certain way. And, you know, uh, the, the, the counter to that, of course, is that you have a, you know, you, uh, being a journalist in, in the United States where there is a first amendment is entirely different from being a journalist in any other country or being a journalist in a semi-democracy or an authoritarian country. So keeping all of this in context, what is your view of the use of these methods? You see, if, if, if you, you hidden cameras you use in a situation where public interest demands it, but there's no other way to get the story out. And uh, nobody has ever accused us of our stories not being in public interest. Whether it is uh, exposing uh, a procurement in a defense scandal, whether it is MPs taking bribes to ask questions in the parliament, whether it is babies being sold, whether it is, uh, um, uh, you, you know, people making um, arms clandestinely, whether it is, I mean, the whole range, I could go on and on, on, whether it is on the Ranveer Sena confessing to their crimes, whether it is the Ram Janmu Mubi Temple movement, whether it is the 1984 Sikh riots. I mean, so even our worst accusers have never said that those stories were not in public interest. It is only the people who have been affected by our stories who come on and take a mock, sometimes really, really absurd defense. Sometimes they say tapes are doctored. Sometimes they say that all this is wrong and we weren't there and this and that. But that you can understand because if you're an affected party, you will choose every legal and uh, other wise defense available to you. I mean, even in the case of Operation West End, there was this whole bunch of, there were 30, I was on the witness stand for one month. And there were 36 lawyers who examined, cross-examined me at one point. And it, it went on happening. They examined mm, mm, Tarun for maybe a week and Matthew Samuel for another one month. So I'm saying that it, it but they couldn't crack the story. There was nothing wrong in the story. You know, the, mm -hmm. the trips put, but they still went on and, 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 and used to give bites to media about how the tapes were doctored and this and that. And ultimately, two forensic reports came out and said that the tapes were kosher. So this is the territory that you live in as an investigative journalist. The people who are harmed by your story will necessarily come after you. And, and the way and manner in which they come after you is not something we, we, they go by the playboard. And as far as um, the US, we should not copy and paste uh, the way they do the journalism and the way maybe us Asians do it. And uh, if a story needs uh, a certain ethical way undercover ethical way, then to me, it is a very kosher approach, especially in a nation where you throw a stone and you get a corruption story. So it is, it is, and it is, it is not like uh, the hidden cameras were the first time used in Tehelka. No, I mean, uh, Indian Express did a story with where they bought, a, you know, the Kamla, the famous Kamla story. There are a lot of uh, television business channels, especially I remember BT, BITV and a lot of other channels started using hidden cameras. Except that, you see, the other point I want to make here is that the kind of stories that we have done in Tehelka and Kovarapur, the burden of proof is very high. And when yes. you have that burden of proof, it doesn't come through notepads. They will chew you up. And so by, by, by default, you have to have some backup. And in, in a multimedia age, the burden of proof became a product for television. So the yes. burden of proof became a revenue stream in itself in the sense of channels wanting to run it, channels become, it becoming a byproduct of a sort of a, a business plan to it. You had you. So in that sense, uh, it, it, it required a lethal potency. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting that, I mean, and I also recall in your book that uh, the, the, the prosecution had all the tapes uh, transcribed for a second time, and yet they couldn't find anything. So, uh, I mean, they this caught is very, very about 15, 15 transcription mistakes, which they made a big deal about in, in about half a million, in 500,000 words. I mean, I would say that is very little, actually. You know, <laughs> Compa <laughs> I mean, compared to the standard we've seen, yes, and we definitely. kept saying that in case of a transcription error, please go back to the tape and judge it, you know. It's, it's, it's a transcribing error. Please understand the process of transcribing is, is inherently uh, faulty. It's inherently error prone. I mean, it, it's inherently, uh, you know, a lot of errors creep in, in transcribing. Indeed, indeed. Uh, on that note, uh, you know, I, I, I'll let you go, Anirudh. Uh, but those who are still watching, please do uh, take the time and read the book, buy the book. It's called A Taste for Trouble. Not only does it tell you what it is like to be a journalist, but it also tells you how you can have fun being a journalist. So 
the best professions have of course a fun element and a public service element both at the same time uh, and so this book is full of that thank you so much anirudh for speaking thanks a lot for having me thanks a lot